Hello, everyone. I would like to call this meeting of the Berlin Boylston Regional School Committee to order. Just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded. Your image and or voice may be broadcast. Um, at this time, I'd like to start the meeting with public comments. So if you are an attendee, I am looking at the um, list right now and you would like to speak, you can raise your hand. All right, so Paul, I see Bill Whitehead has his hand raised. Could you please promote him to the panel? I'm just going to unmute him. He'll be allowed to talk. Okay, all right, so, okay. Bill, right. You, Bill, you should be unmuted. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the time. Uh, there's two bits I just wanted to um, comment on. One, uh, the first one, the easy one, has to do with a business item later on the agenda. I probably won't be at the meeting still because of classes, but it has to do with the MOU side letter um, request from the union. It's very simple. It's a side letter re, uh, pertaining to Appendix A and Appendix B of the contract. When we fully regionalized in 2019, there was a footnote um, in Appendix A about the bachelor, let's see, bachelor's plus 15 lane being grandfathered in for those in it in Berlin, but no one else can be put on it. And then Appendix B has some language, a footnote about um, the stipend amounts for clubs not listed. So any new club created after the contract um, was ratified. The reason we need those footnotes, well, what I think happened was when we updated the contract, um, any kind of formatting pertaining to the footnotes was accidentally cleared or just didn't carry over. The reason the footnotes are important is if we have any new hires, we need to make sure they, they're not accidentally placed in the wrong lane. Because um, eventually bachelor's plus 15 will be eliminated once everyone is off it. And then for pensionable um, uh, stipends, we need a record of it um, technically in the contract for it to account towards someone's pension. So that's why it'd be better to have a side letter now just to get that out of the way. Um, it's more than just a housekeeping item. And I touched base with people who were, I, I was part of the 2019 negotiations, not this last round. Um, and people confirmed that they didn't actively look to remove it. it. It seemed to be an oversight and we just want that noted. So I just wanted to give the quick background on the side letter. Um, and if anyone uh, has a question about that, I can clarify right now. It's pretty straightforward stuff, um, just because I wouldn't be available later. Thanks, Bill. Did, did anyone have any questions? Laurie, uh, I had asked, I, Laurie and I were on that negotiation committee and um, we went back and forth and Laurie and I agreed. It looks like this was just an, an oversight or an error. Yeah. Yep, perfect. And then the um, the second bit, I just wanted to quickly um, uh, more comment um, and appeal to, directly to voters in the towns and less to school committee or administration regarding the budget. Just as president of the union and as a Tahanto teacher, um, just about you know where we are because people are still people outside of education or um, decision making are still asking me about you know well, how come it's affecting one school over the other, et cetera. And just to be crystal clear about um, where we actually are with everything in the state law of June 15th and what, what that's all about. So um, anyone who might be watching this or listening now or at a later date, June 15th is when um, a state law where legally a district has to notify people of a reduction in force, a RIF. And um, right now we don't have the budget we need to uh, run the schools the way we would like. So sometimes people are talking about the whole budget situation as, oh, hopefully we don't have to cut these things. Hopefully, well, it has happened. I've already been part of RIF meetings. People need to be notified and have been notified. So um, to people in Berlin and possibly Boylston, if need be, um, programs are being cut, positions have been cut. At the end of this school year, there are certain positions and teachers that will not be here. So if you want that restored, you have to come out and vote. And um, the piece, you know, with Tonto specifically, that why is that affected by it? Um, the ratio has to be maintained. So again, the, the you know, I, I have friends asking, well, why is it affecting Tonto so much? 
there's that, and these are rough numbers, I understand, that 35-65 ratio between Berlin and Boylston that has to be maintained. So cutting, you know, just over um, $250,000 from Berlin means we have to cut uh, just about $450,000 from the allocated funds from or appropriated funds from Boylston. So that's why Tejanto is taking such a hit. And that's why things are being reduced. So again, those who have the power to restore positions and programs, because they are cut, um, you can come out and do that on the 17th. Um, and again, it, it affects Boylston Elementary with bumping rights. And I can answer any questions about that, where we are one district, so um, within the licensed areas, if a position is cut at Berlin or Tahanto, um, you know, people in Boylston can be affected if someone senior that was cut can bump them out of a position and gets into whole domino effect. Um, so that's why it's affecting all three schools, even though it seems like it should only be affecting one area. So that is it from my end. Um, and again, if there's any clarification you need from me, union-wise, I'm, I'm here and can answer anything. Bill, I, I can't thank you enough for speaking today um, and really clarifying um, to anyone listening what's going on and what we've been talking about now for the past month. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Did yep. anyone have any questions for Bill before he has to go back to school? Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for taking time out of your day. I know how busy you are and it's really important and you're a really important voice, Bill. So thank you for speaking out for the teachers. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And as always, if anyone ever has questions, just shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can and answer best I can. And if I can't get the answer, I'll, I'll find someone who can. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank Have you. a great day. You too. Okay, hey, is there anyone else um, out in the attendees section? We've got 17 people. Is there anyone else that wanted to make a public comment before we move on? You just need to raise your hand. Um, and Paul, I don't, you, Paul, can you give a two second version? Tell these people how you can raise your hand for some of these people that may not know. Yeah, so if you have Zoom open at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you have options and you should be able to click on the raise your hand button. Okay, great. I do not see anyone else. Last chance. Okay. All right, we are going to move on. <clears throat> okay, next. Uh, sorry, I gotta find, here we go. Okay, next is the consent agenda. Could I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Julie? Second. Laurie, second. Any discussion? All in favor, we're gonna do roll call votes. Uh, Laurie? Aye. Julie? Aye. Mike? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Jess. Aye. I'm an I as well. That motion passes. Okay, next up we have my chair report. Um, so first uh, we have some new information on the election. I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Laurie Ann Hart to give us some information on that. Thank you, Megan. So today is actually the first day that you can pull nomination papers and you can get nomination papers um, from the Berlin town clerk, the Boylston town clerk, or from me. Um, you can call me, text me, um, email me. I'm happy to, to meet you and give you the papers. Um, you have to be a resident. So there will be two positions in Berlin. Those are both four-year positions. And there will be one position in Boylston. And that is also a four-year position. There are no longer any two-year positions. That was just so that every two years we have a half the members are re-voted in or voted or or a new cast is is voted in. Um, you don't have to pull papers from both towns. You do have to, whenever you have nomination papers, only people from Boylston can sign one set and people from Berlin from another. And then when you go to get those certified, you have until July 23rd to get your 50 signatures uh, and those have to be certified. Um, and you would take your Berlin papers back to Berlin, your Boylston papers back to Boylston. You can do both towns or just one town. Um, and 
yeah, I think that's that's about it. And so once you get these 50 signatures and they're certified by the town clerks, your name will then go on the ballot in November um, for the position that you're running for. Any questions? Oh, thank you, Laurie. Does anyone have questions about that? Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, the one thing I just wanted to touch upon briefly before we move on is I know everybody's anxiously awaiting for a budget update. So um, I've been listening to a lot of people and, and hearing a lot of things. So I think this is confusing for everybody. So I'm going to try to be very, keep this very simple. So what's next? The next thing is on June 17th, the town of Berlin needs to vote for the budget that the school committee approved on May 7th. Okay. Um, just this week, uh, I spoke with the chair of the Berlin FinCom, Scott Schultz, and on Monday, June 10th, we will be having a joint meeting with the Berlin FinCom and the Berlin Select Board. And again, the purpose of this meeting is to hopefully try to work together and partner together to do what's best for the community. Okay, so I would urge you to tune into that meeting if you have other questions. Um, the other thing is we have a report that the district has been working on. I believe it will be released today. The report is in the format where it has a memo. So it kind of explains everything. Included in that memo are the potential cuts Bill spoke about the fact that Carol on June 15th has to notify people in the that are under the teacher's contract if they may lose their job. It does not mean it's definitely going to happen. It happens if the vote does not pass, if the budget does not pass. So um, I can't remember where I was going with that, but uh, um, so if anyone has any questions about any of that stuff, I would urge you in, instead of, um, there's so many different sources, please email me, but this memo should address some of those questions. And attached to the memo is actually a line item budget. It's what um, the Berlin FinCom and, and some of the people have been asking for. As you will see, it's cumbersome. It's a lot of information. I'm anticipating questions please feel free to email and ask. Um, and the district, you know, between Carol and Michael uh, Wood, who's on this call, will hopefully be able to email any questions, any specific questions about the budget. That's the best way to get your answer. Megan, there was a finance committee in Berlin last night that I um, was told about this morning. Did anyone listen to that? I did I not know about it. it. Yeah, I didn't know about it either. <laughs> oh. Okay, oh, I guess there was very some specific requests mentioned in that meeting. Um, yeah, Scott um, actually emailed me this morning. Um, Scott Schultz emailed uh, Julie and I this morning with the, the request. I think Michael Wood all, already answered. There was a question about the circuit breaker. I think he answered that already. Um, they had, they said that they liked the way Bob Con, Con, Conway, right? Was that Bob? The way They liked the way he did the budget back in, um, 2021. So they requested for the next year that we go back to that format, uh, which is fine. I have no qualms with that. So, um, and then I think he was going to send me a few other questions. Kyle did a great job. Kyle from Link, she did a great job of summarizing the meeting. She sent Carol and I some notes. So um, tomorrow, just so everyone knows, Carol and, and Michael and I are just going to sit down and get our ducks in a row for that meeting. Uh, I spoke with Scott on the phone. He had a few other requests of uh, some spreadsheets he wanted. Michael's already working on that. So um, I'm anticipating that to be a very positive meeting and I'm hoping it will be a turning point in this process for all of us. Okay, that's all I've got. Um, so let's see what's next. Sorry, I've got multiple tabs and screens. Okay, the subcommittee updates. Um, so Jess, did you want to start? I know you guys have been very busy with the Student Success and Technology Subcommittee. Oh, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
Um, Lisa and I had a subcommittee meeting last Friday. Um, WBAC wasn't able to be there, so we recorded it as a voice file. And so I've been having some issues getting that to her, um, but it was recorded in voice format. Um, in that meeting, we talked about, so Megan, when you became chair, um, you passed on your the representation for the school for the master plan implementation committee for Boylston. Um, and so we met a few times. Unfortunately, the meeting was last night during the concert, but I, um, Lisa and I reviewed, further reviewed a very long master plan. Oh, well, it's, sorry, blurred out. Um, but it's a very long, lengthy document about the master plan. And so we went through and saw what was maybe relevant to the school. Um, and there were certain trends, you know, safe sidewalks, and then also building and grounds maintenance um, to be determined. And then also town involvement, uh, you know, getting maybe more volunteering into the schools as a tax break, maybe. Um, I know Boylston has um, sort of a tax waiver um, for volunteer service, but I know the towns had mentioned at one of the meetings, I think Selectman meeting, um, that there was limited opportunities for people with not specific skills. So perhaps the schools can open up more volunteer opportunities for that avenue to alleviate the tax burden on people with fixed income. Um, let's see, during that meeting, we also talked, um, Lisa went to a webinar on green schools and it, uh, there was a ton of resources on uh, different grants and people to talk to about getting those grants uh, for alternative energy and hopefully savings of money um, along with being environmentally friendlier. Uh, so those are some really good resources that she posted in the folder. Um, I'll be posting the master plan um, for the next meeting. Um, and then very briefly in that meeting, um, we talked about um, I didn't open the document. Um, the website, very briefly, we went over it and sounds like more work is gonna be happening on the new website over the summer by Nicole and Paul. Um, it looks good. There looks got some good info, very obvious at the bottom of the website page um, about the budget. So we just took a quick peek at that. Um, and so if people have feedback, they can email Paul and Nicole um, to take a look at it. And then we also very, very briefly, because we thought we had a 3 p.m. meeting to go to, we we think the topics of technology in the schools need to be brought up and further discussion about cell phones at school um, and its effects on mental health, social interactions. Um, also, the elementary school has more smartphones and watches coming into the schools. And so I think that is something that the subcommittee policy committee um, might need to revisit in the near future. Um, it wasn't a comprehensive discussion by far, um, but it's something that, you know, the attorney general or not, no, the surgeon general, sorry, um, did a warning about social media recently. And, and just from sitting at games, I hear students, instead of reading, they're on TikTok and they're shopping and they're Googling their friends. Um, you know, and I, I, I follow, um, school resource officer, um, I forget what his name is now, but there's so many workarounds for kids to get onto websites, even if there are blockages put up. Um, so it is a, a moving target for sure. And um, so it's just something that I think we need to put more on our radar. Um, hey, Jess, do you mind if I say something about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is on the radar for the policy committee. Uh, it is there and I know, uh, I actually saw something come home from technology class with uh, my third grader last week, I think. It was uh, about social media and security and stay safe online. Unfortunately, that's getting cut. So we'll see what we can do. I think once we get past the 17th, policy committee might take up something depending on where we stand. Yeah, yeah. Again, it wasn't comprehensive at, at, by far. Um, and so it was just something that, you know, that I think we needed to look at. Um, and then the very last thing was um, Lisa has been looking at the Tejando handbook and formatting changes only um, the things that she has done. She's looked at Shrewsbury online um, handbook as a guide um, that she and Lisa had looked at. And so um, just making it easier to read and review and um, hopefully more online presence than paper presence. So. 
And can I just add one thing to that? So I'm meeting with Lisa Sequeira next week to go over it. I have a few extra, you know, questions remaining. And um, I think it looks really good. I think you guys are going to like it. And um, we'll we'll send it over to you once Lisa gives it the okay, you know, at least in the current form, so you can see it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jess and Lisa. Did anyone have any other questions for them? I would just say thank you to really tackling the um, cell phone problem in the district because acknowledging that it is a problem and that it needs to be um, dealt with thoughtfully um, with research, certainly with the Surgeon General just releasing that glaring report. Um, I, I think the time is now to act. So thank you for doing that. Okay, great. Oops. Okay, moving on. So budget subcommittee. Uh, we gave an up update on the budget and we have not had any formal meetings since before the budget. So we will move right along to um, superintendent evaluation subcommittee. So I know Laurie, uh, I'll let you speak on that. I know we, we moved uh, Carol's evaluation and our school committee self-evaluation. Um, to our next meeting, which is going to be June 18th. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the timing and the scheduling changes. But Laurie, did you have any other updates on that? Yeah, ju just that um, everybody did complete their superintendent evaluation. Um, Jessica and I have compiled it into um, a report and that will be released the morning of that school committee meeting um, because we don't want it to be a public document. We don't want um, people to see it until it's actually until Carol's had a chance to see it as well. Um, but it is written and we will present at that time. Great. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, Mike, did you have a policy subcommittee meeting update? Uh, we have one policy up for vote and we can discuss it at that time. Otherwise, there's no update. Perfect. Okay, excellent. All right, moving right along, Carol, uh, would you like to, are you ready to give your report? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to mention a few things that have come up. The paraprofessional unionization notification, we did receive that from the Department of Labor Relations, so that is official. We're waiting now to hear from them about negotiations and timelines. Until then, everything remains status quo as far as our previous unified contract with the with the with the paraprofessionals. So that is where we are right now. They did take a vote and supported unionizing. So we'll that's what we'll be dealing with soon, I'm sure, over the summer. Um, you see Assabet Valley Collaborative Year End Report is in there. That is just a courtesy. That's one of the four reports they're responsible for sending to the, the partnering uh, school districts. Um, and that shows their 2024-25 tuition services and transportation rates. So um, as we're partners with them, um, we we're partnerships with other districts, they provide that information. So that's just uh, an FYI for anyone to review. If you have questions about it, let me know, and I will reach out to Kathy Cummins, who is the executive director over at Assabet Valley Collaborative for clarification. Um, the other, the reduction in force recommendations, I just wanted to mention that I have had a chance to speak to everyone who would be affected by the reduction in force um, my, the uh, union reps were kind enough to sit in on some of those meetings as requested by those individuals. To say that those were difficult conversations is an understatement. Um, it was heartbreaking. Um, and so we are all very hopeful about the vote on June 17th. Um, I can't underscore that enough. And I, I will send be sending the official letter to them. They realize that that will be given to them as well. But we did have all the, I had the conversations with all those necessary um, individuals. I also, um, as, as Megan had mentioned, I just also want to mention that open letter that will be coming, the memo to the Town of Berlin Select Board and FinCom. We'll be posting that on the website. I just wanted, we had just gotten it. I want to give a moment to the school committee to digest that information before that gets sent out to them. And then it will be posted on the website and it will go out as a school messenger message um, to to the school community. Um, and obviously it will be sent to the websites for the towns as well. Uh, finally, I just want to mention, uh, just make sure I have everything. I do want to mention in, in the midst of this kind of dark period for all of us to help celebrate um, the retirees from our school district, Deb Draper who is physical education over in Berlin, 
41 years in education. She has the, been at the Tonto coach in field hockey and lacrosse. We just had a gathering for her um, last last week. And many of the former um, teachers, paraprofessionals showed up for that. And uh, it just is a tribute to all that, that Deb has committed to our school district. The other, uh, other two folks, Jane Muti, world language teacher in Spanish at Tejanto. She dedicated her time uh, also to as a senior class advisor. She's been with Tejanto for 17 years. And finally, Elizabeth or Betsy Trudeau, our occupational therapist for 22 years. She's been going between all three schools in the district. Those are going to be those big shoes to fill um, with the work that she has done. Um, she's a tremendous asset and we are going to miss her deeply, her expertise, uh, the way she handles questions um, from individuals and so always so supportive of our children. So I feel very grateful for all of their service to our district and want to thank them and wish them all the be best in their retirement years. So thank you to them. Carol, I just read the first two paragraphs of your memo. Um, I I think the second paragraph needs to be emphasized along with the time of the meeting and maybe some stars around it or something to draw one's eye to that information about the June 17th meeting at 6.30 p.m. Okay, yeah. At the And the other thing, Jessica, as you say that, and, and Megan, I just want to add this piece on too. Megan and I, I I've been meeting each week with a parent group of PTO uh, presidents to chair people, CPAC, and so on. And they are pulling together a, a parent forum for next Wednesday, June 12th at 7 p.m. It's a Zoom forum so we can get as many parents as possible. They are so graciously preparing a flyer for that. They're providing the Zoom access to support as many people as we need to to get on that. They have obviously invited the school committee to attend, so we will get out a posting to ensure that that quorum is represented officially um, as we get on. But I'm very grateful for their support, their suggestions to me um, as we've gone through this process, and they're just their tremendous support of getting this budget passed in Berlin. So, um, so just to make note of that as well. Okay, great, thanks. Um, did anyone have any questions for Carol? Okay, just so for anyone listening, so I know the rifts are a huge topic of conversation and people wanna know what specifically is being cut in this memo that will be released today. Uh, there's a paragraph in there that specifically notes the positions that will be cut. Okay, so please check your email today review that. If you have questions, comments, the best way to get in touch is through email, to reach out through email. All right, if no one Ella, has any further questions for Carol, then we're gonna move right along. Um, so next we have the statutory budget. Um, and I'm going to turn that over to our finance consultant, Mr. Michael Wood. Good morning, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so the statutory budget uh, will only be necessary if the vote uh, is um, a, a no vote uh, for the uh, May 7th budget that the school committee put forward. And um, at that time, the school committee will have the opportunity to revisit uh, that May 7th budget uh, or to start from scratch uh, to uh, ensure that um, in a collaborative way with both towns, um, it can meet the uh, financial needs of the communities. Uh, and um, the significant difference is, however, that uh, under state law, the assessments for both towns will now be computed uh, with a formula that the state uh, requires us to follow, not the regional agreement uh, formula. Uh, and so, um, that formula uh, is uh, something that will be clearly spelled out in documents once we get a, a new budget. And uh, that will explain what the uh, two towns will have to pay in terms of assessments. Okay, great, thank you. So um, just to clarify, so right now we're not, if the vote fails on June 17th, 
budget goes back to the school committee. We can start from scratch. We can make a new budget. We can do whatever the committee and the district sees fit. So at this time, there's really no reason to um, discuss the statutory budget. I think we, we've got this meeting on the 10th with the FinCom and, um, and the select board in Berlin. And then we've got the town meeting and we really wanna uh, stay focused on moving forward with that. Um, so that being said, that's gonna segue into uh, one of the things we had originally planned for a joint, um, the joint, we had originally planned to already schedule the district-wide town meeting. And given the fact that, that now we have this turning point and we are feeling like we, we really wanna work together with the town of Berlin, we're gonna hold off on scheduling that if that's okay with everyone on the committee. Um, Maybe just to be safe, we'll take a vote since we had already voted to do it on June 18th. There is no way we can do it on June 18th anymore, by the way. The way that process works for anyone wondering, you need 14 days notice in a newspaper and it takes five days to get it into the newspaper. So we need we would need to know 19 days ahead of time uh, when the meeting, when this joint meeting will be. And um, before we can, so we can put the notice in the newspaper, but we also need to have a warrant uh, postmarked 14 days ahead of time, and we need a statutory budget that would go into this warrant, and we don't have any of that yet. So given all of that information, we're going to hold off on that um, at this time. Okay, so we're going to move right into the business items. So we do not need to do, so the first vote we have on the agenda is approval to adopt the town assessment using the statutory method. We just discussed we do not need to have that vote today. All right, the next vote is approval of amending the current FY24 school committee meeting calendar. So for that, we had we had at our last meeting, we had voted to have a school committee meeting at 7.30 a.m. on June 18th. Um, given that we are not having the town meeting that night, I would like to um, put it out there to you guys that maybe we meet that night at our regularly scheduled time at 5 p.m. and we get through some of the business that we were supposed to get through on Tuesday, meaning the superintendent evaluation, the self-evaluation. Um, we'll have the budget on there uh, just in case with hopes that we don't need to discuss it, but we will have that on the agenda just in case. Um, and I can't remember if there was anything else we need to do, any other business, but the idea would be we would just meet at, our, at 5 p.m. in person at that time um, on the 18th. So how do you guys feel about that? I'm nervous about not planning ahead for a joint regional meeting that I, I love the optimism that it's going to work out on the 17th, but my fear is if we don't start that process, then, I mean, are, are we just assuming then that it's going to go July 1st to the 112th budget? Cause we, we li literally cannot do it before then. Like, would there be any purpose to do still do the process, even if it hits after the July 1st? I think it's a good idea if we do postpone this focus on June seventeenth. If at this point, if we're not going to make that July first deadline to begin with, might as well take some time, slow down, and reset if things don't go well. Yeah, at this point, Jess, we can't make the July first deadline. Yeah, I'm just curious. I know we go to the one twelfth budget in July first, but even but even after that, if we get a regional meeting and a regional vote and we pass it, but then it would revert to that past new budget, correct? And so hopefully not lose more people to looking for other jobs. I think either way, we're gonna to go to the 112th budget if it does not pass because we don't have the 19 days we need um, to get, we wouldn't have, an, we don't have enough days to get to a, a meeting in July to get to a meeting in June. Yeah, I guess my question is, and I'm not on the subcommittee, so I, you know, I have a understanding, but not a super deep understanding. Like, even if we go to a one twelve budget on July first, if we still had a regional town meeting in July and it passed, wouldn't we then be able to retain teachers, maybe, if they hadn't found other jobs by then? So are you asking if, I think on July 
I can't speak to that. Michael or Carol, could you speak to, I think what she's asking is on Ju July 1st, if the budget does not pass, these teachers actually lose their jobs, right? So as I understand it, the 112th budget is of the uh, FY24 budget. These salaries are in the FY12, uh, FY24 budget. And so technically those jobs are still there. It wouldn't be until we pass an FY25 budget where we were not able to include those jobs in the FY25 budget. Does that make sense? So if we went to a 112 budget, those pink slips or whatever their name is would not be valid? Well, they, they would be valid to the point, uh, they would be valid as we go through the process to pass a budget. So they're like in a parking lot. Thank you for the clarification. And Jessica, I think what I'm hear what I'm hearing you saying I mean, perhaps is that you'll should we set a date now for July? And I I would defer to Megan. I, although I I would just add that I don't think we're ready to do that right at this moment for a variety of reasons. Um, but I hear your and I appreciate your um, it's really your advocacy around holding on to our teachers so that they're not looking elsewhere and finding jobs elsewhere. So that's really important to consider too. But yeah, I hear exactly what you're saying. It sounds like what Michael just said is that deferring to the 112 budget is actually better for the school district than um, have the FY25 budget with the cuts. So um, I think I'm, I'm, and also it sounds like we need to kind of wait and see what happens because then we could reconsider a budget as he said before, and it could be a totally different budget. So it's hard to do all these what ifs and if I've learned anything after this past week of planning meetings and having to cancel them, I think it's better to be more thoughtful ahead of time and then make the plans. But I, I do appreciate the sentiment and I understand and had the same thoughts myself last week. Did anyone else wanna say anything on that? All right, so uh, the vote we're gonna talk about right now is changing the school committee meeting for June 18th from 7.30 a.m. on Zoom to 5 p.m. in person. Does anyone, um, you guys, does that work for people? We had originally scheduled the joint town meeting for that time, so I think everyone is probably free, but I just wanna make sure. So then instead we will not have a 7.30 a.m. meeting the morning after the Berlin town meeting, which is good for all of us. Um, and then instead we'll just meet at 5 p.m. and plan to, to um, conduct our regular business. Okay, I'm gonna put a motion on the floor. Um, okay, so could I please have a motion to amend the current FY24 school committee calendar, school committee meeting calendar to change the June 18th, 2024 regular meeting from a start time of 7.30 a.m. on Zoom to a start time of 5 p.m. and in person. So moved. So, was that Lisa? And then a second. Jess is the second. Any discussion on that? Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Mike. Yes, aye. Julie. Aye. Jess. Aye. Laurie. Aye. And Lisa. Aye. Okay, I'm an aye as well. So our next school committee meeting will be 5 p.m. June 18th. We are not meeting at 7.30 a.m. on that day. And we will be in person in the multi-purpose room at Tahanto like we usually are. Carol and I will get an agenda out sometime next week. Okay, so next was the approval of the, the date for the new district-wide meeting. We're going to skip that per what we just discussed. Okay, the next thing is an approval of an alternative meeting notice posting location. This has to do with open meeting law. I am going to read something to you guys. Um, hold on one moment. Let me find it. Just bear with me because this is the best way to explain the situation. Okay. All right. So, um, currently the location, currently our district has not adopted our website as the official 
notice posting location for our agenda. For regional districts, this is an option in the state of Massachusetts. So um, today I am going to make a motion that the school committee adopts uh, the district's website as the committee's official posting method for our agenda. If this passes, the district clerk, so that's you, Laurie, um, you need to file and post notice of the website address, as well as directions on how to locate the agendas on the website or any notices, which I'm sure Nicole and Paul can help you with, um, in both the two member towns at each official meeting notice location. Okay, so in Berlin, I think it's on their bulletin board. Um, and in Boylston, I think it's on the website. Once those notices have been posted in the towns for 48 hours, excluding Saturday, Sunday, and legal holidays, the committee may commence use of the district's website as the official meeting notice location. So this could happen as quickly as next week if this vote passes today and if, uh, Lori, if we can get those notices posted. A written notice of the ad adoption of the district's website as the official notice posting location must be filed with the attorney general's office as well. So that's something that uh, Carol and I can work on tomorrow. Um, all right, so the, the location of the meeting notices, it should be in a prominent place on our website, which I think we have it already. We have school committee and then we have agendas, or we could even put a tab that just says all meeting notices. Um, and I think that is it. So the only downside, according to our attorneys, would be like if the website is down. I feel like that happens so infrequently. That's not a huge deal. But if the website is down during the four during a period of the forty eight hour posting window, we would have to cancel our meeting. So hopefully that won't happen. Um, did anyone have any questions or want to discuss that uh, any further before I make that official motion? Yeah, I think the website has to be down for more than six or six hours. More than six hours. Thanks, Jess. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that the agendas will still be distributed to the towns and um, that email will be sent out with the agenda as well. My understanding was the process would be the same. It would just, so Nicole sends the agendas to the distribution list. It would just eliminate poor Dawn and Eloise from having that pressure of having to get it posted if they're not there. Um, and for those that don't know, I think the Berlin town clerk works eight hours a week and Boylston is eight to two Monday through Thursday. So there's days that they're closed um, and it's just tough on them. So we figured we would alleviate that pressure from um, the town clerks and put it onto our, um, onto the district. All right, any other questions? Okay, great. I'm gonna make that motion right now. Let me go back. Okay, I would like to move that the school um I would like to move to adopt the district's website as the committee's official notice posting method. Moved. Second. Okay, Mike and Julie, um any more discussion? All right, roll call vote. We'll start with Julie. Aye. Mike? Aye. Jess. Aye. Lori. Aye. Lisa? Aye. All right. I'm an I as well. That motion passes. So um, hopefully sometime next week, if not the week after, that will be our um, website will be the official notice posting location. And towns can still post. They can do whatever they want. They want to post it on their website. They want to put it on their bulletin board. It doesn't matter. They can do whatever they want to get the information out. All right. Next. Great. Okay, so this next one, actually, we do not have a vote. I have another script to read to you. Um, and then if there are no objections, there no further action is needed. So you will see in your emails, I literally just sent it because I just got it back. Um, uh, it's some documentation from our attorney. You can take a look at that at your convenience. Um, so we received an open meeting law complaint from Margaret Stone on May 31st, 2024. Everyone should have a copy of the complaint. I believe I did forward it the day after on June 1st. The complaint alleges that the committee violated the open meeting law when it updated the meeting notice for its May 28th, 2024 meeting because the notice did not contain the date and time it was amended. District Council has advised that open meeting law requires that amended meeting notices must contain the date and time of the amendment. The committee and staff are now clear on that requirement. 
District Council has prepared a draft response and you should all have copies of that draft. If there are no objections, I will work with town councils to finalize the response letter or district council to finalize the response letter and submit it to the complaint in the attorney in the attorney general's office. Okay, so does anyone have any objections to that? Okay, excellent. All right, so thank you all so much. Oh, no, next, sorry, some red items. All right, Julie, we've got the Marion Hoffman Scholarship. Do you wanna give us a, an update on that? And then we can take a vote on approving that scholarship. Sure, am I on mute? All right, You're sure. Good. So the Marion Hoffman Award is given every year. Um, one student from each fifth grade class at Berlin Memorial School is selected by the fifth grade teachers to receive this scholarship. Um, the scholarship is awarded to students who volunteer and are avid readers, like Mrs. Hoffman was. Um, the teachers will present these two awards at the fifth grade recognition as they do every year. So I'm recommending a $50 award amount um, for this 2023, 2024 school year. And I'd like to make a motion to accept the $50 recommended. Um, so moved. Laurie? Or second, second, I guess she made the motion. Oh, oh yeah, Julie made the motion, Laurie seconded. Okay, any discussion on that? Okay, roll call vote. We'll start with Jul or Julie. Aye. Mike. Aye. Jess. Aye. Laurie. Aye. Lisa. Aye. I'm an aye as well. That motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Okay, so we have an MOU request from um, the BBEA. Um, that's what Bill spoke to. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions on that. Okay, great. All right, so I'd like to um, make a motion to um, approve the MOU request from the BBEA as written um, in the drive. Second. We're so moved, I don't know. Yeah, Do you need a yeah, second? That's fine. <laughs> Jess, and then do we have a second? Lisa? Second. second. Okay, any discussion? All right, roll call vote. Julie? Aye. Mike? Aye. Jess? Aye. Lori? Aye. Lisa? Aye. All right, I'm an aye as well. That motion passes. I'll get that signed for Bill and the union. We can get that signed and get that all set tomorrow. All right, last vote, we have policy ILD, which is student submission to educational surveys and research. It was a first read last time. Did anyone have any questions on that policy? Yeah, so we didn't really have any discussion last time on the first read. Um, there are some concerns and I, I was curious if that the amendments, the highlighted portions were reviewed by our council. Has our lawyer read it? Is that a no? <laughs> okay. I, I just, I have some significant concerns. I know the original ILD policy comes from MASC, um, which obviously their legal counsel would have reviewed, um, but I have some major concerns that it violates the first and the 14th amendment. Um, and there's some cases that speak to this specifically limiting rights of the students. Um, and so I, I think it's opening a big can of worms if we don't have our legal counsel review at first. So I would actually Which parts, say that again. Which parts? Um, the highlighted portions that you added in. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I guess how so then? So, yes, do you want to share it on the screen so everyone can view that? If you can do that, or can somebody do that? Paul is the host, I think. Yeah, Paul can probably do it. Oh, no, I think you can share. I might. Okay. Sorry, if, if anybody has if anybody has it up, they could. Share. I have it up. If Can you give me privileges to share? Um, you should be able to. It, you should have a share screen button. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Try now. Right. 
I'll try it that way. Can you see it? That's yeah. great. Thank you. Perfect. I'll just hide that. Um, so the, the highlighted portions were what you added on to the MAC policy. So, you know, I, I think this came up about a survey that was sent out in terms of that it was included in the, um, the capstone or the civil project, um, CAP. And so where you added any purpose, regardless of who or what entity asked the question, that would then include that. Um, and so I do have significant concerns about that portion. And then further down, you further um, added in number three. Um, so third one is sex behavior attitudes. And so then you added in sexual orientation, gender, preferred gender, anything related to student sexuality. Um, and so I, I think that does violate. Why don't, take, why don't we take them one at a time? So the first one, the first paragraph there, regardless yeah. of who asked the question. The yeah, so one. if it's student driven or if it's district driven, I, I think those are two different situations. Yep, so the, uh, the original policy is uh, uh, this policy, it says uh, any surveys, analysis, evaluations for gathering data. And the issue here was uh, sort of a gray area when we did talk to the attorney that because a student sent this, they weren't covered by the policy, not necessarily that uh, they couldn't do it or, or not allowing them would be a freedom of speech issue, but it just didn't mention uh, students in the policy have mentioned the district. So the the attempt here, everything, every change in this is intended to inform parents before something like this happens. It's not to deny or not allow this to happen. There's nothing in here that says it cannot happen. Everything just says if it's going to happen, instead of telling parents after it's been sent out, we're going to inform them before it gets sent out. That's what all these changes uh do so so it's not, none of these changes would deny this from mm -hmm. happening they none of these changes would deny what happened at the hanto from happening it would just require that a parent be told before their sixth grader sees a survey like that in their email so it sounds like the lawyer reviewed the first portion did they review the other edits throughout the document as well there was a general conversation whether, yeah, related oh. to the complaint. But this wasn't at the subcommittee policy meeting? Uh, we discussed it at the sub policy, subcommittee policy meeting, yes. With her? She was not there. She was not there. Just generally speaking, we don't run our policies by the attorney. Um, MASC gives us what they think is the, you know, or what they, what they approve. And then we tailor it to what we think um, the district wants based on what we've gotten from how, you know, how we run our schools as well as what the information we've gotten from parents as well. Yeah. So I just so want nothing to in here, know. nothing in here denies anyone from doing anything. It just requires that they inform parents beforehand, just like several of our other policies do. I, I think it is, like you said, it, you, as you said, she thought it was in a gray area. And I think some of these additions are in gray areas that I might think you misunderstood when I said that. Uh, I didn't say sh she said that this is a gray area. I said the event in question because we didn't have this policy in place. We've never had policy ILD in place. So because of that. Yeah. So I'm not know. questioning ILD. I'm questioning the edits that were made to it. Mm -hmm. And because I think those are in gray area and and. Should yeah, be so how, further. what's the gray area? So I think it is violating the first and the 14th men of the students. Yeah, how so? It doesn't prevent them from doing anything. Well, you are you are limiting them. No, it doesn't limit anything. Then may I pose a question to Lisa? Lisa, how would this policy, as it's written, affect the, the, caps, the um, civil project in eighth grade? Um, it would impact... Um, both the projects in eighth grade and um, as juniors, um, there will be a presentation of the CAP project of the juniors this afternoon. 
Um, and it it's to, to have students, uh, it's just going to severely limit their ability to gather information from students. And um, from my understanding, the um, this particular um, policy and law around, you know, th these eight components have always been focused on um, federally distributed or school distributed um, surveys um, or um, surveys from third party vendors. Um, these have never been put into place as far as I know, and I've done um, quite a bit of research um, indicating student surveys. So surveys that have been distributed by, you know, schools and third parties and federal surveys are under these strict guidelines, um, but the guidelines have not been transferred because students are not considered agents of the school. So um, it's, it's, you know, I've never, I've, I've never seen these policies um, around student submission, submitted surveys. Um, it's going to make it very difficult for the students to get the information they need. Um, if it's going to be all surveys, we send out surveys frequently. It's not all surveys, Lisa. It's only surveys that fall under the eight, eight areas. areas. Yeah. The other thing is it it's not it shouldn't have much of an impact except in a timing way mm -hmm. because this policy is already based on law that prevents you from doing this anyway so whether we have a policy yeah. or not the law should still be followed what it right. does is it tries to clarify what the committee would want in regard to asking students specifically about their sexual orientation i don't think in the committee the sub policy committee didn't think that the schools or even other students should be using school equipment to officially ask about student sexuality. If students want to discuss their own sexuality, they're free to do so. This doesn't prevent them from doing that. It prevents others from requiring them to answer questions about it. Through I don't survey. think they were ever required. And I think the surveys were anonymous. You're right, they, they weren't question. required, but they weren't told that they weren't required or it wasn't, it was, you know, think of yourself as a 12 year old you receive a survey in your email from school and it says answer these questions or, or however it was worded. The point of this is not to prevent that from happening. The point of this is to let parents know that this will happen beforehand. So nothing in here says you can't do it. Nothing in here says a student can't do it. Nothing in here says the schools can't do it. It's simply the original policy is that you have to, parents have to, if parents request, they can see the material. The effect of this is basically to say, we don't need them to request it. We're just going to let them know beforehand before we send it. I so, guess my, my concern is we learned that parents don't open emails. So the last oh, section. Oh, yeah, that's true. So the last section, it says we'll be required to opt their children in to participate. And so by that, having, being able to opt in rather than an opt out, which is the the policy for our puberty talk and, right. and um, the other talk that's given, at least at the elementary level that I've seen. So this is this, that by opting in rather than opting out is going to eliminate most students because as we learned, parents are not opening their email, mm -hmm. not reading oh. the beautiful newsletters that are being sent out with lots of information. The opting out scenario creates problems because they don't read their email. And then they find out about it after the fact. And then we get complaints and why yeah. the hell are you letting the schools do this? And, Open and your we'll... email. We're in 2024. Well, I'm with you on that. You know, I agree so with you on that. I don't yeah. think the students should be punished because parents aren't opening their email. If you want to opt out, then it's your parental right to do that. But it's if not, the students. It's not punishment. I think well, it's. Uh, if it's not if they're punishment. not going to have any children to take it's... the surveys for their civil projects, how will they be able to do it? Well, it's information and transparency. Uh, the school might have to work a little bit harder to get those parents the information, but it's not preventing anyone from doing it. I'm not arguing sending the information out. I'm I'm arguing the opting in versus opting out. Okay. But I couldn't in the survey. I I I'm, I'm I kind of agree with Jessica on this one. I mm -hmm. agree with the um, opting because you have the option to always opt out if you want to. 
Um, now we're reversing that, putting it in policy to opt in. It seems well, to be complete. Wait, I'm going to talk that. Issue with that, 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 that. that. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think that's opposite of what we currently do. In addition to that, like your point about the survey that was sent out, um, and I have kids that received that survey that were younger, um, mm -hmm. and it wasn't very clear. You're right that they didn't have to do it, but we, they could just fix that on the survey and just write, you know, that you don't have to respond to this. Yep, and I, there was that meetings is, that that the the procedure is now different because correct. of that. So I think the and feedback I, is important. Yeah, I agree. I think the feedback is important. This is a big project for these kids. Is this capstone? Um, so we want we want to work toward making them have that data available to them. So Julie, when you and I discussed this survey when when we found out about it, yeah, you said you didn't know about it until after it went out. That's correct. Yeah, and then I yeah. met with. I met with um, Superintendent Costello about it, and yeah. I, I voiced my concerns. And then there was there was corrective action taken. You know, I, I don't know that it needs to. I, I'm not. I, I'm not so sure that the policy needs to change. Well, it's, it's not a policy change. It's a policy implementation. We don't have this one on the books. Yeah, can we just go, Jessica, to the top where it has those legally required areas? This is per a constitutional law right here. So the yeah. one through. One through, can you scroll down just a little bit? Thank you so much. One through eight is legally, like, regardless of how we feel about it or not, you have, like, this is a law. You have to get parental consent. It's only things under this umbrella. So anything that doesn't fall under this umbrella can, doesn't need a parent opt-in. It's just these particular sensitive areas that the Constitution um, protects student rights under. So this is a, 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 even though we didn't have this as a policy, MASC had this as a policy. And if you scroll down to the very bottom, you can see the actual law it relates to. We didn't make this up or go looking for it. Um, it came to our attention because of, a, of an issue with a student survey that a parent had, and it led us down this path. So I just want to be clear on why this exists and that it wouldn't impact, like, unless it falls under these criteria, it's not going to affect parents don't have to, to say for every single survey that they want to opt in or out. Well, that's what it's saying, though. It says regardless of who sends it. So the, the edits that yeah. you made, I, I actually went to the MASC website last night and looked up the, the regular policy, and I understand why it exists. Um, but the edits that were made makes it much broader, and it's the additions um, are concerning to me, and, and the fact that you're opting in, and again, all the other policies are opting out for these more sensitive topics. So and I, I see Lisa with her hand. The right. issue is that the schools aren't informing people of these opt-outs. They The kids weren't informed in this case that they could opt out. So, that, so that's perhaps the since then, have. Mike, since then, Mike, they have. Yeah, well, since then, that's great. But right. so, the policy well, I'm just is saying. still, you know, sort of uh, codified. The procedures were you know? changed. So maybe we could right. hear from the admin of what procedures were changed and what's going cool. on with that. Lisa. Go, ahead, Lisa. go ahead, Lisa. Lisa Sequera wanted to speak. Mrs. Sequera, please go ahead. You're on mute. So there, so we did um, you know, with within a very short turnaround, um, within a, a day, um, we addressed the problem. Within a week, we had um new procedures in place that have been um being followed. Um, there has to be very clear identification of uh, you know, there has to an in introductory paragraph has to be placed in every survey that goes out, um, identifying who is, um, you know, why the survey is being done, what class it's being done for, um, you know, if the survey is anonymous, you know, how the information is being used, um, and all surveys um, for all surveys can go out to um, high school um, if any surveys are being requested for the middle school um, those have to have you know a special approval all surveys have to have approval by the teacher um, there has to be a second layer of approval for anything that goes through the middle school um, the middle school the eighth graders also do their own surveys as well. So their surveys have to have the same procedures, but they are limited to, you know, surveying, you know, the middle school. Um, and so those protective measures have been put in place. And I am familiar with um, this, 
you know, the U.S. Department of Education in these eight areas of concern. I, I'm only familiar with it um, for being federal surveys, um, surveys being presented by schools themselves, and then third-party surveys. I'm not familiar with this gu these guidelines as related to student surveys um, because, um, you know, they're not agents of the school. So th that's, I am, I am not, I'm not familiar. I'm only familiar with the law that has to do with federal and school distributed by agents of the school and third party. So Jess, starting at the top, the, the two pieces of yellow there, and if you want to strike those, I, I wouldn't argue that too much. The original isn't too different. Uh, and I think this all covers it. The second paragraph there talks about, I think what Lisa was just referring to. The original language says that no student should be required as part of any program to submit to. Uh, that would be the answering of the survey part. Uh, what we added there, be included in or be sent, that is just saying that uh, not only are they not required to submit to it, uh, but they're not required to be included or sent to it if it contains any of these. And that's the part that relates to the opting in piece. So if, you, if the committee wanted to strike the first two yellow amendments, I wouldn't really argue too much about that. I think Kara would like to say something. Okay, go ahead, Carol. Carol, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know. No, just for this to help for informational purposes in your decision making as a committee. I want to cut a couple things. We did start to talk about this in our subcommittee meeting. This was one of the policies that came forward to us from MASC, as Lori, you know, spoke about. So as we looked about this, we had a a, a number of of legal documents with us, laws around discrimination of students that we were looking at as well. I did reach out to the t attorney at that time, you know, to say we're starting to discuss this, some feedback around, uh, you know, give us some feedback around that, what we can allow and so on. Um, I was also charged with um, getting like a kind of finding out what other districts were doing. I said I would look into that. So we did do that. Um, we had the result was out of we reach out to 39 different districts to find out what they were doing. 15 of them came back with a response that just said, basically, they allow opt-outs and in a variety of ways, either in the kind of old-fashioned way that you could opt out, similar to if there's a sex education unit, or just the offering parents, parents want to opt out of surveys coming from, from students. So it was a little less than split as far as that. The other piece I wanted to just mention to you, because my... I, I'm learning this too, as far as budget uh, policy subcommittee protocol. The, I did talk, ask the the attorney about how this happens when a when a document or policy that's being entertained comes to the school committee in in this way, um, because we did have that follow up meeting. You can do a couple of things here. You can either, you know, as you're discussing now, that's exactly what you should be doing. Um, you can bring it back to the subcommittee, you can vote on it as it is, or you can vote it down. So just things for all of you as a, a school committee to consider um, your options. Mm -hmm. um, that That's all I just wanted to mention that from a protocol standpoint, and because we're all learning all of these different things. So. You know, I, I think especially this meeting, I know it was scheduled 11 a.m. because of the timing of the budget. And so 11 a.m., it was a miracle I could make it, but most people are are working. Um, and so I think this is a very important conversation and one that we need to include the lawyer in with the, the, the additions that were made. And, and so I would like to make a motion to table the vote for this particular policy um, for further discussion and revision. I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion on, so the motion on the table is to not vote on this policy today and have Kim is, Kim. Table it to the 18th, I don't know. So Kim is, our attorney is uh, 
in Asia until July. So um, I, I don't know. Um, but can someone from the office, her office, look it over? We can. Yep. I think that's just, is that, would that satisfy that request from legal? Yeah, I just, we don't really want to incur more legal costs um, well, if we vote in a policy that violates an amendment or, or something similar. So that's my main motivation. I think this is an important conversation to have. I think people have different viewpoints. I think information should be given. Um, but I think having the burden for parents to opt in versus opt out, like all the rest of our policies, um, does not is not appropriate for this policy. So I just, I think further discussion from the community um, for all viewpoints. And I, you know, I know it's uncomfortable to stand up and say something that's not a popular view firsthand many times. And so I hope everyone should be made comfortable to voice their opinion so we can make a vote. Jess, may I ask you a question? Opinions. May I ask you a question, Jess? Sure. The crux of this policy is the sexual behavior and attitudes piece of it. I'm confused as to why schools in general and certain individuals are so concerned with finding out, asking about, and demanding students submit to questions about sexual behavior and attitudes. I really am. And the intent of this is to allow parents who don't agree with that to have the information beforehand rather than having to respond to it once it arrives in their child's hands. I'm confused as to why that's controversial. Yeah, so I'm disagreeing with some of the phrasing of demanding uh, people do surveys. So again, it's optional. And after the event of that survey, the, the procedure changed and more mm -hmm. information is given up front. I agree that for controversial ones, that survey should go out just like the puberty talk that is happening today, you know? So, but I think with every other, puberty policy, is the, it's, you know, puberty is a longstanding health thing. Parents can opt out of that. I agree. But in this case, as it was explained to us in the complaint, students felt pressured to respond. All this policy does is pressured. give them the heads up. No, they, well, the ones I talked to felt pressured. So I have three at that level. Nobody felt pressured. It was just a everyone survey. Has their, everyone has their own individual opinions of what they want their child to be exposed to. And if that's what you want, that's fine. But you would have the option to opt in in that case. So oh, again, I think the information... Sorry, Julie. Sorry. I was just going to say, why can't you just opt out? Well, as we know, there's a communication issue in the district. And as a safety valve, I guess, it's the opt-in that would provide additional layers of safety in these cases. The opt out is the situation we existed in and it made its way through those gates. I don't think that it actually existed at all. I don't, for those surveys, cause it was students. No, it, it existed, it, it was law. It's, it doesn't, just because we don't have policy ILD doesn't prevent us from, you know, falling like, I don't have a policy that I can't attack someone. Doesn't mean I can attack someone cause there are laws about attacking people. Yeah, but to, wasn't to what Lisa said, she said this has, in general, not been applied to student surveys. It's been applied more right. to admin and federal. Can we have yeah. Laurie? Laurie wanted to say something. Can we have Laurie? Go ahead, Laurie. Yeah, thank you, Megan. So I just wanted to make a comment because I feel like there's a division here that is is imagined. I've gone through it on Facebook where I've said something and it turned out to be something opposite of what I said. So I just wanted to make a point here. You know, we're supposed to respect all people and and their beliefs. And there are this is a separation of church and state, too. This is a religious issue right here. And I'm just going to give you an example. Um, my second year of teaching in Westford, I mentioned something about my sister being gay. And I had an Indian parent contact me who said, you know, we love you. We, we appreciate all the things that you, you do for our son. But that's something that in our culture, or at least for them, their family, they didn't agree with. And all she said to me was, I would, could you please try to respect the fact that our family is a little bit different? And it, it I, you know, I, I could have taken offense and been like, well, you know, what do you, instead I thought, you know what? You have rights too, and I have to respect them. So it's really important when we're talking about being open-minded that we're, we're thinking about all sides that are involved. And I think this is a, a, a it can be 
a really divisive topic. And our intent is not to divide or to say that one side is right or wrong, but to respect all people involved and where it comes from a law. And this is in because a lot of things are different now than they were when this law was written. We felt that this was important to put in to respect those parents, not to say we can't talk about it, but to respect those parents that would feel like this was stepping on their family values or their religious values. And and so that's, I just want you to understand the that sometimes I think people assume there's different corners. And I don't think you real, I don't think that that has anything. When Mike and I sit down with Carol and we talk about this, we always think about what's best for the children and what's educationally sound and what's right for the family. So there's a lot of thought that goes into this. Um, and I would encourage people to, to follow our policy meetings, but I just felt that that was really worth saying. Um, because, you know, Jessica, like you, I, I have family members um, and this is this is an important topic to me, but I recognize that to other people, it's a sensitive area. And so that's what we're trying to be cognizant of. Right. Yeah. So, okay. oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Oh, it's all right. No, in these eight examples that are mentioned in the policy, I mean, they're they're protect, protected in a variety of ways by our laws for a reason. And I think that they do deserve special treatment in our policies here, you know, in our school district as well. So it just kind of puts them in a special class where we, because they are already in a special class and we're acknowledging that by asking the parents to opt in so that they, they're fully informed. And also this is just for surveys. This isn't if like, they're still gonna do when they do the, the science bait, you know, when they're doing the, or what, I'm not sorry, not science, the health. Yeah, health class, you, science, anything, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 this is for surveys. If you want your child to participate in a survey. And oh, by the way, it says at the bottom, I think if you're 18, so if you're a senior and you're 18, it doesn't apply. So, it's, so I, I think yeah. this, so, it's, I, I'm on the fact, I see, I think, I, I don't want to paraphrase what I, I don't, I get what you're saying about the opt-in versus opt-out. Um, I don't know. Sorry. So I when I went to the conference in November, I went to a talk uh, run by actually the, the lawyers that um, Kim works for or is in the practice. Um, and so there was, many cases cited for very similar things, although it was more in reference to like people wearing t-shirts for their beliefs. And so what, you know, there's Tinker versus Des Moines, Independent Community School District, 1969. There's also 200, uh, 2008 Gilman versus School Board for Homes Country. And, and it goes back to the first and the 14th Amendment. And, you know, and, and what those precedents sent was it, isn't lewd and doesn't constitute a threat of violence or substantially disrupt the work of school or interfere with the rights of others. So, you know, I'm not arguing the policy. I'm I'm concerned the language that was added in applies it to something that is a whole nother situation and that we need more legal guidance on. Um, you know, Lori, if, if you were the one that was gay, you know, that is like pretty much you have to apologize for existing. And I'm not trying to promote any agenda as I have been accused. I want kids, parents, families to feel safe for existing and to feel belonged. And I feel like that's- Yes, I think you're going way off topic. This has nothing to do with feeling safe for existing if you are or are not a certain way. This is about parents receiving information about surveys their children are gonna be asked to describe their sexual orientation. I don't think this is controversial. You can still ask it if you want to ask it. Just let the parents know ahead of time. That's all this does. For this conversation to happen at 11 a.m. when parents can't watch, teachers can't watch, staff can't watch. Well, it's not I, happening at 11 a.m., Jess. It's the vote of a first read of a policy that was been out there for two months. I understand. And we didn't discuss it at the last meeting because of time it restraints. First, it was a first read. Anybody could read it. Nobody's written in about it. So the vote right now is to. But has this been distributed? Does do any of the admin people have this this policy before it was out in the presented? documents for our last meeting? They don't have access to our drive. Nicole, no, Nicole I'm pretty posts, sure released the documents. I think Nicole puts the first reads on the. There's a, it's a great point. There's a spot on the website 
uh, that we put, she zips up files that we talk about and they're all on there. So wealth of knowledge. So I think this policy was out there, but yes, I agree. Do, are, do people know that? And are people reading it? I probably not. Right, right. And we know That's that from fair the budget. Point. We know that from the budget. We're not, yes. they're not reading it. You know what I mean? We can't use that argument. They're not reading it. So I, I agree with that statement, Jess. There, really, there are no people here because of the time of the meeting to weigh in on this. It's, you know, I... My biggest thing, I, you know, I, I'm all fans of information. I, I am very sad that the hyperlinks got taken out of our agenda so people know what's happening. Um, you know, everyone's busy, everyone's doing 10 million things, but, you know, to have the access to the information in your face on the agenda was nice. Um, I, I'm, I want the information to be distributed. So if there's a survey that's going out that's confident, uh, you know, controversial or might, might take offense from any religious, you know, or, or personal beliefs, distribute that information it's it's just the opting in versus the opting out that doesn't coincide with all of our other policies or similar topics that i think is then limiting the students freedom of speech and no way does this limit freedom of speech you are by by parents not opening emails you are limiting their ability That's to a do personal their choice project if you choose not to read it's a personal choice if you choose not to read your email you people read your emails how's that it's I agree. I agree. A, the the information is being out there. What you decide to do with it is your decision. That's not limiting free speech. And if you want to take action, then opt out. I don't know why it's different from all the other policies. Can I ask a okay. question about the free speech? Is sending a survey considered free speech? I don't know that we should be getting into a free speech uh yeah, but that's, but that's what Jessica's concerned this, uh, about, that it's limiting free speech. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, we're not stopping anybody from stating their thoughts about anything personal. So, so I so mentioned the, the, the Department of Education, MASC, they, they come up with this policy. All we're doing is two things, the opt in versus the opt out. And all number one through eight were fairly detailed in what they mean, except for number three. And so we clarified what we mean that in here and it uh, includes additional details about the protected classes. That's it. Well, no, you're asking that it doesn't get sent. Unless they opt in, yeah. Yeah, well, so yeah, it's different just, things going on. Yeah, it's you're not saying an ASG policy sent. and the changes need to be reviewed by a lawyer and, and things need to come back from the community. So I'm not arguing the policy itself. I just would like to table the motion on the table is tabling the vote itself because I think there needs to be a whole lot more discussion that didn't happen before today. Okay, so do you guys want to vote? I understand what you're saying. You want to, we want, it'll have to be, we can send this to um, Corey. We have a, an attorney that we've been assigned and say, okay. say, is this legal? That This is the motion on the table. To no, the motion on the table right now is to table the motion. To table this vote, right? To table the vote, yeah, exactly. Yep. And have if we do that, legal. right? And if we do that, the action would be someone has to reach out, whatever, to um, council to ask. You're, you're asking if what specifically is legal the um, the yellow highlights, the additions to yeah. the MASC IL, and, right. and you want to give parents a chance to come in and weigh in on this at the June eighteenth meeting if needed. Yeah, I, I would really like hyperlinks to be added in so people aren't digging. This discussion has nothing to do with hyperlinks, Jess. We've, we've been over the agenda. Right. How do you distribute? I know you don't like the hyperlinks everything. and you made a motion to end that as chair, but you are not chair now. And if we want information and people you. to give us opinions, then we need to distribute the information. That's why the whole budget issue is arisen. No, that has nothing to do with this, Jess. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Julie. And I was just going to say, I, I would, I would agree. I mean, I mean, we, we, we want people to weigh in on things, and they need information. I would absolutely agree yeah. with that statement. Right. The we, hyperlink I mean, issue, that, rather than taking a million hyperlinks and having people have to open several different things, one file with all materials is distributed through a single location on the website. That's what happens. This was sent out that way. Nicole does it every meeting, right? So now I don't even think the admin knows about that hyperlink. Go through six different locations. Right alongside the agenda is a file with all the materials for that meeting. That's what we did. It's on the website. Yeah, I agree. I think doing the hyperlinks is um, was a little cumbersome to whoever was doing it. I mean, 
because then there's access to the, the drive issue and all that. So I well, that was the issue, right, Mike? Yeah, there's several issues, yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's Someone talk about- Someone in IT can figure that out, guys. All right, sure. so let's talk about the hyperlinks at a later date. If we want to talk about the hyperlinks, let's put that on the agenda for a later date. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. that's something we talk about in the fall or, you know, because quite frankly, I'm school committed out for the summer. <laughs> I'm just going to get through the budget. Um, all right. So the motion on the table is to table is to yeah. table this vote to June 18th. Correct. All right. We've had Correct. discussions. Does anyone want to say anything else about it? All right. Well, you're wrong. All right, just sorry. Can you stop sharing your screen so I can see people? I'm also very Zoom illiterate. Oh, here we go. Now I see. I can't see everybody. Can I just add? I just yeah, Carol. Sure. Been bothering me, so I just want to say, from the administrative perspective, with this, here we go. Thanks. We, we would wait because the school committee is responsible for policy, and when the superintendent sits in on the policy subcommittees, it's to guide and advise. But but that's why we are staying out of it. I'm sure everybody in the uh, the administrative team has their different opinions and would love to jump into the arena. But we're being respectful of being asked if we have information that will aid in making the decision um, or as Lisa shared, for example, what they put in place since that, that incident that Mike is speaking of occurred. But we would not we would not share our opinions on this. It's not about that we can do our our knowledge base on it, what we have made available, what we can make available and get for you. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that because I know my, I, in respect for my administrative team and myself, it, it's a school committee handles a policy and the way you're discussing this is exactly what you, you should be doing. And as that's why I said to you before, you have some options about how you want to go forward with this, the vote, tabling it as you are, sending it back. That's your decision as a school committee. But this is this is your purview. How do I stop sharing? Sorry. You did. You did. You're good. You did. You're good. Thank you. Um, okay. So the motion on the table is to just table the vote on this policy. In the time we would, somebody would reach out to legal counsel, and you know, I don't know that we can email this out to parents, but you know. If, if people have questions about this, if anyone that's watching this video, if you have questions about this, it would give people the opportunity to email a question in and we can reply to that. Um, and uh, the policy is on the website for anybody that wants to look at it. Um, okay, so we're gonna do roll call vote. We had a motion, we have a second. And so we'll do roll call. We'll start with Mr. Tomman. Uh, no. Okay, then Je uh, Jess. Yes. Okay. Yay. Yep, okay, then Lisa. I sorry, I I don't I see. see a problem with 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 um waiting with it. Okay. Yep, Julie. Aye. Okay, Laurie. Mm -hmm. Aye. Okay. I'm an I as well. I don't see a problem waiting. And but it's at the next meeting we have no parent emails or anything like that. And council says it's fine, then we'll vote on it. And I hear what you're saying, and I'm a little torn about opt in, opt out, but I, I think it's a sensitive topic. All right, so that motion passes. So we're gonna wait. We'll have it on the agenda for June eighteenth. Um, Laurie, maybe you or Mike could just forward this. It's Corey. I'll give you guys the response. I just sent it to you, Megan. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so without further ado, so I know we were invited to. Some of us were invited to Tejanto. So I'm gonna. Um, I don't think we've got anything else. We have our next meeting June. Uh, 18th at 5 p.m. And some of us were invited, or all of us were invited to Tejanto today to go see um, a presentation by the students at one o'clock. So I'm going to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Julie? Second. Jess? Okay, roll call. Mike? Aye. Jess? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Julie? Aye. Laurie? Aye. I'm and I as well. Thank you all so much. And sorry that we had to do this at 11 o'clock. We're trying to follow all the rules, but I appreciate everyone coming out today. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.